It's a pleasure for me to be here. Thanks to Bayer for inviting me here. Um, I'll try to uh, drive you from the, uh, clinic, from the theory of the guidelines to the uh, clinical practice in the management of community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, oh, this one? Yes. Okay, good. It doesn't work? <laughs> Can I work on this? Oh, please. Well, we can start with my disclosure, just for y y your information. And well, I can say next if you want. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we can go to the next one, please. And next. Okay, uh, just to, for starting, a, uh, a question. Uh, the, the early use of appropriate antibiotic therapy is essential for improving mortality outcomes in critical ill patients. Do you agree? The, the answer can be first, the one is tot I totally agree. Uh, the second one, I agree, but there is a the risk of abuse of a few remaining more active antimicrobials with high cost and emergence of resistance. Third, I disagree. I can, you can delay the therapy for one, two days in order to improve diagnosis. Please vote. Okay. <laughs> Results. Yeah. Oh well. So we can discuss about this. Uh, the uh, about 60% uh, of you say, well, I agree. I have to use uh, as soon as possible the appropriate therapy. Uh, one third of you say, well, I have to think a little bit, and only 6% disagree. So uh, we will go and see what, uh, if there is any any uh, data that could. Uh, you know, sustain the, the totally agree. Uh, next, please. So, one of the point is that mortality is uh, deeply impacted by the inadequate therapy. If you look to this uh, slide, you can see that in uh, uh, orange, you have inadequate therapy that leads to a very high mortality. But next, if you look to, can you go to the next one? Click. This is our, no, no, sorry, go back, yes. This is the adequate therapy mortality. So even if you go for in ventilator-associated pneumonia with an adequate therapy, you have still a very high mortality. Next, please. Next. Next. So you must take in account when you say adequate therapy means that the bug is susceptible in vitro to the drug you, you gave to the patient. Next. Next. <laughs> okay. Uh, I put here the example of vancomycin. If you have vancomycin with the, uh, uh, yeah, you have to see there, uh, with MIC of one, you have the uh, failure rate of about 30%, 70%. So the bug is susceptible, but the result is not good. Because, because you have to take in account many things, not only the, uh, the MIC of the bug. Next one, please. You have to take in account dosing, timing, and tissue penetration. These are the, the three most important things. So the microbiology help you very much giving you the MIC. Thank you. Then you had to go to the. Okay. Good. Now it's working. Uh, yeah. So the, the main problem is that you have to take in account many things. Uh, the site of infection, the antibiotic you use, the bug plus MIC, 
and certainly the patient. The, the problem is that you have to take into account an early recognition of infection, adequate treatments for sure, and then you have to go as soon as possible to the right drug, select the appropriate drug, and most importantly, you had to treat them of the taking account the PKPD data. One of the problems is that different antibiotic, different PKPD. If you look to beta lactams, beta lactam are time dependent, you know very well, so you had to go to a very high level, the high level over the MIC of the drug for the longer time you can do. So continuous infect, infusion, for example, or long infusion of uh, beta lactams. If you go to aminoglycoside, we learn in the last 20 years that you have to use high dose in single dose, a single dose, single high dose. Why? Because you reduce the uh, side effects, uh, the renal side effects, and you improve the activity because aminoglycoside works on the con maximal concentration you can reach compared to uh, MIC. If you go to other antibiotics like fluoroquinolone, you have uh, both Cmax and uh, the AUC, that means the quantity of drug, the overall quantity of drug in the blood, in the, in the, in the body, that means that you can use fluoroquinolone in different ways. For example, levofloxacin, you can use 750 milligrams if you think that Cmax is more important, or 500 milligrams twice a day if you think that AUC is more important. Clearly, you pay this with the uh, more side effects if you use 500 milligrams twice a day with a, a higher efficacy probably, and you uh, gain a, high, a good efficacy with 750 milligrams, but in, with less side effects. The other, the other antibiotics works in a mixed way, and so you have to know what we, the antibiotics and the PKPD, so you can dose the drug in the best way and use the drug in the best way. Because in this way, you can decrease toxicity, you increase efficacy, and you decrease the resistance uh, appearance of, uh, in, in the box. What about timing? Timing is important. The question was early, soon, yes, early and soon, because when you go to uh, the uh, bloodstream infection and bacteremia, uh, and you look to uh, appropriate therapy at the beginning, you have a uh, mortality that is almost double if you have an appropriate therapy only after susceptibility determined, determination. So it's very important to have a proper drug as soon as possible. The site of infection is also important because the antibiotics go in different uh, uh, compartments. If you have an infection in the alveoli, you need antibiotic in the epithelial lining fluid, maybe in the bloodstream, maybe in the cell. If you have Legionella or mycoplasma infection, you need very high level of antibiotic inside the cell. And beta lactams will not reach the cell. And uh, you need macrolide or fluoroquinolone. If you look to macrolide, particularly azithromycin, you have a drug that goes inside the cell with a low level in, in the bloodstream. So if you have a, a sepsis, azithromycin is probably not the best drug. If you go to, for fluoroquinolone, fluoroquinolone reach the epithelial lining fluid inside the cell in the bloodstream. So it's very well uh, in equilibrium in between the, 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 the three compartments. So you have to choose the antibiotic also in a view of where, where the infection is. Let's go to another question. When you are choosing an antibiotic, antimicrobial agent and you are selecting the dose, do you consider the physiological changes that are occurring in your critically ill patient? One, no. Two, yes. Three, interesting question. But how can I select antimicrobial agents and or dosing during physiological changes? Please vote.
good? Not all of you have voted? Okay, all right, interesting question. Uh, yeah, uh, yes for uh, the majority, just for 1%. And uh, uh, the, so we will discuss about the, the selection of antimicrobial and dosing during the physiological changes because it's quite interesting. Let's go. So uh, you can divide the antibiotic in hydrophilic and lipophilic. This means a different way to, uh, of the, co uh, the, how the uh, antibiotic works in your body. Uh, hydrophilic usually go have a low uh, distribution volume, are, have a clearance that is mainly uh, by the kidney, and they have a low intracellular penetration. Hydro, uh, lipophilic antibiotic have a, a very high volume of distribution, uh, the clearance is mainly hepatic, and they have a very good intracellular penetration. In the case of uh, in ICU patient, you have a PK, a pharmacokinetics, but may be very, very different from the uh, healthy subject, because you have a, maybe having a higher volume of distribution, and this means that the, your hydrophilic drug have a higher clearance, or a lower clearance, dependent on the, on the renal function, and the, your lipophilic antibiotic uh, have a volume of distribution that is practically not changed, and the clearance depends on the hepatic situation. So if you have a li uh, hydrophilic, means uh, beta-lactam, aminoglycoside, glycopeptides, cholestin. Lipophilic means fluorquinolone, macrolide, lincosamides, tigecycline and linezolid. So you have to take in account what your antibiotic is doing. The other problem is, as underlined by Professor Van, is the antimicrobial resistance. But this is a global problem, and in, in the, in the uh, uh, bottom of this slide, on your right side, you can see the Asia-Pacific situation that has been uh, described by Professor Van, and clearly is a problem. And what can we do? Well, the facing the increasing in resistance of antibiotic, to antibiotics, but mainly for the main pathogen, Strem pneumoniae, uh, uh, and in your country, Acinetobacter baumani, I know is a, is, a, is a big problem. Certainly, we had to, to think how to deal with. And we have a clearly problem in ICU because 80% uh, of the, your, your VAP isolates are resistant to more than two drugs. Acinetobacter may be uh, resistant to multiple drugs, and uh, uh, gram-negative pathogens also are important, and are, uh, we have to deal with a, a lot of resistance. But this is true also for strep pneumonia, because in your country you have a, a, a lot of resistance in, in strep pneumonia. So clearly the right use, the correct use, the appropriate use of antibiotic is very important. What are the risk factors for a patient coming from the community with a, 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 a pneumonia and going to ICU? Uh, well, if there is a long-term uh, mechanical ventilation, is clearly related to risk factor in terms of resistance. The use of antibiotics is very important, particularly the third generation cephalosporin, fluorquinolone, and carbapenem. But one of the main point is the inadequate choice and an inadequate dosing of antibiotics. Let's go to uh, the critically ill patient. Uh, you can have an increased volume of distribution. This means that you, are, you have a sepsis, so you lose fluid everywhere. The, this means that you increase the volume where the, the antibiotics should be distributed. And this may be important for hydrophilic antibiotic. And you can have a clearance variation. So you have an increased clearance or a decreased clearance if you have uh, organ failure. This means that in the first case, when you have an increased clearance, increase in the volume of distribution, you have to think to increase the dose of the antibiotic. If you have any, a reduced clearance for renal failure, for hepatic failure, you have to reduce the, drug, the, the, the dosage of the drug. So you have to look to the patient and find the right way to, to use the antibiotic. Another, another uh, question for you. Which pathogen is the most frequent cause of 
known as ICUs, ICU acquired pneumonia. First, pseudomonas serruginosa, methicillin resistant staph aerosol 2, three strep pneumonia, four legionella, five klebsiella. Please vote. The majority of you said, well, cell pneumonia is, is, is the pathogen that I have to deal with. And then I have uh, many others, pseudomonas and uh, MRSA and so on. Let's look to uh, the data. Certainly, cell pneumonia is the first pathogen, uh, even if ground negatives are, are important, as uh, Professor Van showed us. Uh, look into uh, the Asia situation. Uh, you, you can see that in a half and half the situation can be different uh, in the different countries. And uh, one of the point is this one. We published this paper. Uh, is a uh, uh, meta-analysis of uh, all the data that are uh, at, uh, published on uh, non-ICU uh, uh, pneumonia. And you can see that you, you can divide in early onset, late onset, and severe. Uh, non ICU uh, pneumonia and uh, strep pneumonia is still the first pathogen but if you go to the, with more severe uh, uh, pneumonia you, you can have MRSA and Enterobacteria C as the uh, leading pathogen. Uh, let's go to the, uh, the problem sorry uh, to the problem of the uh, fluorquinolone activity uh, because you have at least three uh, different uh, Quinolone to be used, and you have to, to take them in, in consideration of the different bacteria. If you go to, uh, sorry, okay, uh, gram negatives uh, and gram positive, the uh, uh, MIC level are quite different in the different uh, fluoroquinolone, and this means that uh, you have to take in account the, uh, uh, the different uh, approach. And clearly, if you look to strep pneumonia, we, it's clear that moxifloxacin is the first one. Uh, if you go to atypicals, again, moxi and levo are the two uh, more active drugs for atypicals. You know that there are uh, papers on uh, legionella infection showing that fluoroquinolone are far better than macrolide in treatment of legionella. Uh, for pseudomonas serruginosa, the ranking is completely reversed. Uh, clearly, Cipro is the most active. If you look to the European Respiratory Society guidelines, uh, we put moxifloxacin as the first, part, uh, first drug for strep pneumonia, levofloxacin for legionella, and uh, uh, cipro, uh, ciprofloxacin for pseudomonas aeruginosa. So the rank is, uh, is confirmed also in the guidelines. Uh, now I have a, a couple of cases to uh, going from the theory to the clinical practice. Uh, the first case is, uh, is a, uh, a man who arrived in uh, uh, December, is Sunday. You know, Sunday uh, has been uh, demonstrated as the most dangerous day to come to the hospital. Uh, she ar he arrived at 4 a.m., uh, so also the night is not good. Uh, is a 29-year-old male. Uh, he's arrived in an emergency room uh, driving his own car. <coughs> he had a fever, 30, 30, 39 degrees, dyspnea, productive cough, since two weeks. So he waited two weeks and, go to the hospital, and went to the hospital on Sunday uh, early morning. It's not a good choice. Chest pain in the last 12 hours that bring him to, to the hospital. He's a policeman. His medical history is active smoker, uh, allergic asthma in, in his ch childhood. Uh, he referred allergy to pollens and no drug actually taken. Uh, the arterial blood gas analysis show a pH of 7.4, 7 PO2 is uh, 53, PCO2 32, 
saturation around 90%. The uh, white blood counts is uh, 18,000. The uh, C-reacting protein is high, is 15. And the, as for the chest uh, pain, the uh, doctor on duty uh, tested for troponin, that was high, and D-dimer, that was high. Chest X-ray. Here we are. Have a look to. This is the front, and this is the side. So, your diagnosis. You are in the uh, emergency room. Young man with a high troponin, high, uh, fairly high troponin, fairly high dimmer, fever, cough, pulmonary embolism first, two, sever severe bilateral pneumonia, three, severe exacerbation of COPD as a smoker, four, bilateral pneumonia and pneumomediastinum, five, bilateral pneumonia and myocardial infarction. Please vote. So uh, most of you said uh, it's a severe bilateral pneumonia. And then there are someone who said, well, there is something more than a bilateral pneumonia, uh, a myocardial infarction or a primomediastinum. Only few of you go for uh, embolism. Uh, the, the story is not for embolism. Uh, the uh, D-dimer may be high because there is inflammation. So, uh, well, let's look what happened. Uh, before going to, well, you have to start a, a therapy. What are your, uh, your choice? Piperacillin tazobactam as a single agent, ceftriaxone azithromycin, three, respiratory fluoroquinolone, four, ceftriaxone plus respiratory fluoroquinolone, five, piptazo plus fluoroquinolone. Please vote. of you go for uh, respiratory fluoroquinolone alone or ceftriaxone plus fluoroquinolone. Okay, only f no, no, none of you will go for piptazo alone. Let's go. And then, should you, we use something more than just an antibiotic? Can we go for invasive medical, mechanical ventilation? Should we go to non-invasive ventilation? Should we go to high flow cannula or dentary mask? Please vote. Mechanical ventilation, uh, none of us, almost. Non-invasive ventilation, high flow nasal cannula, and the Turing mask. Okay. Go ahead. So what the ER, ER physician did? Well, he, the diagnosis, he, he put the diagnosis, severe pneumonia. So most of you said as is a severe pneumonia. The same decided the, the ER, ER physician. He started with cetriaxone plus azithromycin, following our, our protocol. Severe pneumonia, you can choose between ceftriaxone plus azithromycin or ceftriaxone plus fluoroquinolone. So he chose for ceftriaxone azithromycin. At five uh, point, uh, uh, after one hour and a half after the admission, uh, the patient was sent to ICU because it was too severe to stay in a, in a ward. 
And uh, there, they started with a non-invasive ventilation, but there is no effect. He had a new episode of desaturation. So the uh, anesthesiologists in the ICUs decided, in Italy, the, the ICU is run by anesthesiologists, decided to have a CT scan. There is something more. He was not uh, very, very pleased of the situation. He asked for a, a urgent CT scan. This is the CT scan. So there is a massive pneumovediastinum that is located in the anterior, middle, and posterior paraspinal paracardiac areas and a bilateral pneumonia. So there is something more than severe pneumonia. The problem is that if you use uh, non-invasive ventilation in this case, you increase the, the, uh, the pneumomediastinum. And in fact, the, the, the patient did not respond to NIV. So the uh, positive pressure was promptly stopped, and we go to high-flow nasal cannula, as you suggested. And uh, the antimicrobial therapy was changed. Moxifloxacin, Piptazo, and Tamiflu was started. It was December, the peak of our influenza seasonal, stage, uh, seasonal infection. Uh, the uh, blood gas analysis in high flow was good. Uh, there is an improvement of the patient. We looked to the an urinary antigen. Legionella was negative. Strem pneumonia was positive. The, they performed also the virus research search, and they found Boca virus infection. And it, it also was tested for HIV because the age, it was negative. With this treatment, the patient was discharged after 18 days. You know, the eye flow cannula uh, can help you when you have a uh, uh, pneumothorax and a pneumomediastinum, so it may be much better than using the NIV. Uh, the therapy was uh, changing in Piptazo Moxi because of the, the uh, presence of gram negative, anaerobes, or whatever you, you can have. So at the end of the day, the case was done. Okay, let's go to the second one. Yeah, we have time, so we can go. <laughs> this is another, another interesting case. It's uh, another man. Uh, he's an elderly man. He's 71. Uh, it was admitted for uh, dyspnea, fever, productive cough, and hemoptysis. Uh, it was st started three days before the, the admission. He had a renal insufficiency and a COPD. Sometimes it's better to ask to a wife or the partner about the, the health of the, of the people. And then the, with, uh, the wife said to us, well, he had a high alcohol intake and he, he, he smoked a lot, a lot, he said. Ten cigarettes is not a lot, but he, you know. Let's go. On physical examination, drowsy, temperature was 39. The heart rate was 120. Blood pressure, 80 over 50. And the respiratory rate was 28. The uh, bilateral course crackles and ronchi were present. Laboratory findings, a world blood count is 12,000, with most of them are neutrophils. The hemoglobin concentration is fine. Patel count is 91,000. The C-reacting protein was 60, it's high. Blood urea nitrogen is 280, and creatinine is 18 milligrams per, per liter. And the only thing is good is the liver function. The arterial blood gas analysis, pH 7.25, PO2 is uh, 54, PCO2 is uh, almost 56, uh, lactate is 3.5. So, first of all, initial intervention, venturi mask, one, non-invasive ventilation, two, three, go directly to intubation. Please vote.
okay so well okay yeah uh, the majority is for non-invasive ventilation uh, some of you are for venturi mask uh, and some of you are uh, for a, a uh, intubation so uh, indeed the patient has a, a pH of 7.25 uh, uh, is an old man but he has COPD and something some problems you know that the uh, rules for uh, ICU admission are quite different in the different countries. Uh, we are very conservative in the admission to ICU. And uh, uh, when you are old and you have COPD, sometimes you stay in, uh, in the pulmonology department and not in, uh, in the ICU. What happened? Oh, sorry, another question is... Uh, you go for chest X-ray plus CT scan and start an antibiotic, or chest X-ray, CT scan, microbiological sampling, and then antibiotic treatment. Please vote. Most of you are following the guidelines. So we need microbiological sampling before starting treatment. In this case, probably you have to, to take many things. So what are the, uh, your idea? Should we go for sputum and blood cultures? Should we go to, for tracheal aspirate and blood cultures? Should we go to bronchoscopy, urine antigens, serology, swabs, or all of above? Please vote. Some of the, of the exams are, are mutually exclusive, but uh, you know, it, it, the, the idea is to obtain microbiology sampling. So uh, what I, I can do, I'll do. And uh, this is the, 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 the message. Okay. So what happened? The uh, ER, ER physician started non-invasive ventilation, uh, perform a chest array and a CT scan, take blood and sputum cultures, make urinary antigen testing, and started with septriaxone plus azithromycin. Uh, tummy flu, because also in this case we are in the uh, season on influenza, and gave fluids. This is the, the chest X-ray. It's arriving? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, and a, a flash on, on, uh, on the CT scan. So, what happened to the patient? Well, after three days of azithromycin, septriaxone, plus Tamiflu, really the patient didn't, didn't, didn't respond to the treatment. The uh, fever was still high. Uh, white, blood can, uh, white blood count is almost uh, uh, similar and CRP is going up. The arterial blood gas analysis on uh, uh, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, is there is a, a fairly good uh, improvement with a pH of 7.33, PO2 is uh, 77, PCO2 is 45, uh, lactate is still a high, it's still free, it was 3.5, so the patient is not going well. Uh, there is a uh, urine antigen that are negative for Legionella and strep pneumonia, the nasopharyngeal swabs for viruses were negative, blood culture negative, sputum culture was positive for Acinetobacter baumani, but it's not so uh, bad because it's susceptible to um, um, ampicillin sulbactam, piptazo, cipro, moxy, cortimoxazole, amikacin, and imipenem. 
It was resistant to other beta lactams. So the question now is, uh, uh, what does the antibiotic ground for uh, Acinetobacter baumani prompt you to do? Change antibiotics, transfer to ICU and change antibiotics, transfer to medical ward and change antibiotics. Please vote. So most of you uh, correctly say, well, it's a patient that is clearly not stable. Uh, there is a, a, a difficult to treat pathogen. I would send it to ICU and change the antibiotics. So what antibiotics? Should you go to Piptazo? Should you go to Imipenem or Meropenem, whatever you want? Should you go to a, an association with, between uh, uh, imipenem and fluorquinolone or one with piptazo and fluorquinolone or going to imipenem plus aminoglycoside? Please vote. Most of you will go for imipenem fluorquinolone, uh, one third of piptazo fluorquinolone, and that's it. Okay. So what we know is that we, if you use a fluorquinolone and uh, you have an Acinetobacter uh, baumani, uh, there is some data uh, that show that there is a uh, additive of, of synergistic activity with piptazo and chefepime. These are in vitro data, so you have to take it as an in vitro data. It's not uh, in, in vivo data, but it's quite interesting. Uh, the decision of a the, of the physician was to go for piptazo plus moxifloxacin. Uh, I must say that we try, in Italy, we try to save the penems, imipenem or meropenem, as a third choice because we have a big problem with Klebsiella, uh, so we try to take the, uh, the penems uh, away from the treatment as soon as we can. Uh, so we usually start with piptazo, with a combination with piptazo. Uh, in any case, the, the result of the, of the change of the treatment was good. The patient uh, has a reduction in uh, uh, white, blood, uh, white blood counts. Uh, the CRP is going down. <coughs> And the patient was transferred to a medical ward at day seven, and he was discharged at day 25. However, he died <laughs> 35 days later for acute myocardial infarction. So you probably know that pneumonia is one of the main risk factors for myocardial infarction. And uh, we had, uh, and the, the reason for failure of treatment of pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia, not only uh, hospital acquired pneumonia. Uh, one of the main points, about one third of the patient had a failure related uh, to cardiovascular problems. That may be major arrhythmia and myocardial infarction. What are the risk for dying of myocardial infarction after the pneumonia? Here we are. A nosocomial infection, community acquired Acinetobacter infection is a clear risk factor for myocardial infarction. Alcoholism, and this patient was uh, a AV use of alcohol, and leukopenia or normal leukocyte count, that means a, uh, immunosuppression in some way. So this case was well uh, managed, fairly well managed in the hospital. No one think to have a, a prophylaxis for myocardial infarction. And this is a clearly open, an open question, and we are 
Now discussing, uh, we are preparing the, the new guidelines for severe community acquired pneumonia the, by European Respiratory Society. And uh, one of the questions is the definition of severe pneumonia, but it's a it's quite open question. And the other one is, the, the, should we, one of the PICO questions, you know that now the guidelines use PICO question. Well, another PICO question is, should I use prophylaxis for cardiovascular event in, in, our, in, in patients with severe pneumonia? Because the, the, there are some data that showing this, this correlation, but there is no indication to use any prophylaxis in this kind of patient. Should I go for aspirin or you know, uh, for heparin or whatever? So still an open question, uh, and we can discuss with, if you want. And uh, so the conclusion, we had to use early antibiotic therapy as soon as possible, as I said, because this can improve mortality and improve secondary outcomes of uh, severe pneumonia. In patients with pneumonia, whatever you, you, you call it, CAP, HAP, uh, HCAP if you want, the uh, etiology is, uh, is, main, is different in the different countries. And uh, also the uh, impact of, of drug resistance may be very different in the different country. So you must know what happened in, in your country, and your, but not, not only in your country, but probably in your area, because it's very important to look at. And uh, certainly, the use of antimicrobial is not an easy task. You have to take into account many things. Uh, you, I show you a, a puzzle of things that you have to take into account, but it's just uh, a, a matter of uh, uh, indication. We, you have a, a lot of possible uh, in, in interference in the, in the use of antibiotic. So clearly, you need a good diagnosis. Uh, you had to try to go to a pathogen-directed therapy if you have the, the possibility. Professor Van sh showed us the use of real-time PCR. It is great. It costs a, a little bit, but it clearly gives you some uh, important information. And that the, the main part is to use your knowledge about PKPD in the use of antibiotics. So going for the right dose, going for the right duration of therapy, going for the right way to administer the antibiotic. And this, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh.